Our next speaker is Pietro Perona. Uh, Pietro is the Alan Puckett Professor of Electrical Engineering at Caltech. He did his PhD at Berkeley in 1990 and came to Caltech after that, where he's been ever since. Thank you. <clears throat> well, so first of all, thanks to the organizers for putting together the meeting. And uh, it looks like it's always Irvine to do the job. And I mean, it's fair because they're in the, the middle of Southern California, so they, it's easier for them to gather everybody. But thank you for all the, the work and the good uh, energy and uh, inviting you know, excellent people to speak, and so, apart from the, for this one. Uh, OK, so um, I'll talk about a bigger picture uh, question, which is the one of Visipedia, a project I'm uh, running with um, Serge Belongi at Cornell Tech and, uh, and our students. Uh, and I hope that um, uh, talking about it will give you ideas on uh, the next uh, question you want to ask in your PhD. And, and so I hope that will be productive uh, in that respect. So I'll start with this picture, which I often use. Uh, and this uh, picture, so in the, in the uh, mid-2005, 2010, I thought, well, you know, all of the world knowledge is now at my fingertips on the internet. I am uh, perfectly happy with where we are. I can learn anything I want and so on. And my father-in-law sent me this picture. He was walking in the woods and saw this mushroom, and he wanted to know if he could eat it. And he knew that I, I like mushrooms and I like picking mushrooms on the Alps, and maybe I knew something about it. And I took a look at it and told him, so I texted back, absolutely don't eat it. This is not going to be a good thing for you. Um, I, I wasn't quite sure, but I, I had a strong sense that it was not, not, uh, not to be uh, consumed, uh, at least by him. And, uh, <laughs> and so why did he send me this picture and not look it up on Wikipedia? And the answer is very simple. But if, you, if you look at the mushrooms page on Wikipedia and you try to work your way towards any species from this page, uh, it doesn't work. In fact, explicitly, um, at the time, but still today, I checked yesterday, still today, Wikipedia tells you if you want to identify a mushroom, buy yourself a field guide. And that's how you identify it. So here was, staring at me, an obvious situation where um, the internet is not dishing out uh, the right information uh, to me, and I cannot, it's not in my fingertips. Um, and, um, and yet it's there. So the, uh, the page for that uh, species of mushrooms is there. So it doesn't need to be there, but it's there. And so why couldn't I get to it? Well, because uh, this is a visual query. So I look at an object. Uh, I would like to know its name. And so it's the opposite. I don't know what to type. I want the words back, and I want the information back. I want other images that relate to it back. And so uh, images are a bit of a, of a dark matter of the internet. It's very difficult to, to get to them. And <coughs> these visual, visual queries are in front of us every day. We don't notice it because we are numb to the fact that there are some things we will never know the answer to. But if an expert was near us at the moment when we have the question in mind, then of course the answer would be forthcoming. It would be very easy to ask the question. We'd say, what is that? And we point at it, and the expert knows what we're meaning, and they can give us an answer. So there is nothing intrinsically complicated. It's just that the internet doesn't work well with images and doesn't give access as access to information with images. And so what, what do the questions be? And so you see a bird, which species is it? You see some script, you know, what does it say? What script is it? Uh, you know, is this a uh, skin lesion or a mole that I should have my dermatologist check today? Uh, or should I live with it and be happy with? Which Roman emperor is this one? Oh, what a nice tree. I'm wondering what species of a tree and will it suffer from uh, climate change in my in my region. So there are lots of these questions. And every day, every hour, we have some of them in mind. So what we would really like to have, and this is you know, one possible uh, incarnation of Visipedia, is that <coughs> we see the object, and we can take a photograph of it. And this is our portal to the rest of the information. And then by, by magic, something like this happens. And the phone tells us it is a um, Chipping sparrow, OK? So that's a species of that bird. It's a chipping sparrow, OK? So this would be the vision of the future that we would like to propose. And um, in other terms, we have a world of information on the left. We have um, 
users with visual queries on the right. They don't know what, uh, what to say or to think. And you would like some mechanism to connect uh, your visual queries with all the information that is out there and is uh, hopefully available. And so the question is, how uh, do we make it happen? And so many people in the room will say, well, don't worry. Uh, old man, there, is, uh, there are deep networks now. And so the problem is solved. And we have uh, sorted it out, module a few details that people are working out. It's, uh, it's all done. And so what I would like to do is convince you that uh, maybe deep networks are uh, a useful tool. In fact, they are. Uh, but there are lots of interesting questions that we haven't solved and that are uh, blocking our way to, to Visipedia. So the things I will talk to you about are uh, the question of fine-grained categorization, long-tail distributions, where to get the information in the real place, in, in the first place, and I may talk a little bit about discovery uh, later on. So first of all, <coughs> what do I mean by fine-grained categorization. Well, think of feeding this image to your favorite uh, deep network trained on ImageNet. And what answer do you think that it will give you if it's correct, right? And so the answer would be, it's a bird. And so as someone said before, I think it was Kevin, well, please tell me something interesting for once, right? And so what it's, yes, I knew it was a bird. That's not good enough. What should it tell me? Well, maybe it should tell me, it's a sparrow. Well, actually, uh, a sparrow is a fairly generic answer, truly. The, the right answer you would like to know is it's a chipping sparrow. And why? Well, because sparrows are all over the world, but each species of sparrow is very specific to a place. And if you're interested in uh, climate change and the effect of climate change on nature, you would like to know which species of bird it is, etc. <coughs> now, how big is this uh, problem? Well, if you look at um, the birds of the world, it's about 10,000 species. How many people knew that it's about 10,000 species, the birds in the world? How many people are birders in here? One or two? <coughs> OK. So it's about, um, and it's about 15,000 forms. If you consider females, males, and uh, juveniles, which for some birds uh, look different. Now, if you want to look at the sparrows, uh, these are almost all of the species of sparrows, and you can see that they are quite similar one to the other. So this is going way, way beyond um, uh, ImageNet. And so here is one of uh, the very irritating two species situations. So there are chickadees, the North Carolina chickadee and the black-capped chickadee. They have different habitats, uh, very similar, and there is a tiny difference on top of a wing which tells you uh, which one is which. And I would never be able to, to tell them apart. OK, so this is the world of birds. But of course, our visual queries are not limited to birds. They're you know, very broad. And so how many things would we want to uh, work our way towards? You know, how many different categories should we think of recognizing? OK, 10,000 birds, and then maybe 20 or 30,000 Chinese characters, et cetera. Well, so if you look at the species, how many species of living uh, things are there? And so there are about 8 to 10 million species. And I was surprised to see that most of them are animals. I thought that most of them would be plants. But no, most of them are animals. And you can read faster than I can say all the other things. So OK, so 10 million. And then uh, how many man-made objects are there? So if you think of the Library of Congress or the things you can buy on Amazon, you get uh, to a few more tens of millions, maybe. And then there are many mountains that people can recognize around the world, celebrities, Chinese characters, and then stuff and stuff and stuff. OK. So if I, I would say we should aim for 100 million. Um, I, uh, if somebody said, no, it's 10 million is OK, well, OK, 10 million. But anyway, so it's much, much more than uh, what <coughs> ImageNet is giving us today. And so this poses, I think, two interesting problems. One is you know, the usual scaling problem. ImageNet is 1,000. We feel pretty smug about how fast have we made progress on ImageNet. But now we realize, OK, 1,000. But now we have to go to a million, uh, almost a billion. 
Okay, so it's uh, quite a few, five or, or six, maybe the orders of magnitude more. Uh, how long will it take for our networks to do well? And will the architectures of the networks need to be revisited before uh, we, are, we are good enough there? And so that's a, a good question. Second question is, is the question of the long tails. And so here is, um, the, uh, here is the problem. And so here we've, we married the two words. Uh, worlds. Um, uh, Mike Jordan this morning told us about big data, and Tommy told us about uh, n going to 1, or maybe n going to 0. Um, and so here you see both of them. And so you see that big data is also small data. So what's happening here? Uh, these are uh, the birds of the world. And this is statistics from a feed of uh, bird images, uh, eBird from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that we are getting every week. And so there is a student uh, sitting in the room, uh, Grant Van Horn, who is uh, on the receiving end of this feed. And so these are about 800,000 images we've received in the last six months. And uh, we've counted the frequency of each species. So out of about 15,000 forms, here we see about uh, 6,000, 8,000 maybe um, have at least one, uh, one image. 9,000 have at least one image. But some uh, species are highly represented, but some are not represented enough for current learning algorithms. So if you are one of those people who believes that for training properly category you need about 1,000 exemplars, well, you have only 216 species that you can learn properly. And uh, if you're one of those people who believes that uh, you're happy enough with 100, then you have about 1,000 species that you can learn. And that's out of, again, 15,000 um, forms. So how long will it take us to get at least 100 images, blah, blah, blah? And so you can think of about 30 or 40 years of this feed that gave us in six months about a million images. Okay, so yeah, it's a kind of zip law with a saturation. So you have a slope of minus 1.5 here and a much shallower slope here, which may have to do with the fact that photographers know that those species are very common and so they don't care about what I'm thinking, but uh, I don't know exactly. Okay, now, <coughs> uh, so our current, uh, so somebody was talking about MS Coco earlier, so just uh, to point out, MS Coco is not MS Coco any longer, it's Coco, because Microsoft uh, somehow dropped its sponsorship, and now there will be a foundation supporting Coco, and I forget the name, we just named it, it's going to be the, um, co well, it, it will come back. Uh, <coughs> but when we built Coco, we imposed on ourselves that we should have thousands of images per category. And so some categories we were aiming for 100. Some categories were ruled out because we couldn't get enough images for them. And so we decided we cannot possibly expose the community to, to too few images. It's not serious. Well, I think that the serious thing to do is to embrace the fact that we have long tails and we have to deal with them. This is what the world looks like. Okay? So this is a key question for machine learning today. Lots of categories uh, in the hundreds of millions type uh, number. And some categories only one, two, or three training images. No matter how many Google image things you have, there are very few for some categories. And so we have to uh, live with this fact. And we have to embrace the long tail and work with it. And so if you're curious to know, you know which birds are which, so the most the most common photograph is a bald eagle. You know, guess why? And uh, about um, the 217th is Columba livia. It's a rock pigeon that you know about. And about the 1,000th is some yellow-bellied um, lark, prairie lark. Did I say it right? Yeah. Meadow lark. OK, it was almost there. OK. So now uh, I've asked uh, birders, and, and humans learn with about three to seven pictures. And so that's the human uh, performance for you. It's about um, six, uh, six times, so a factor of six number of categories we can deal with more than current machines. OK, so this is the first take-home message, the long tail uh, challenge. 
So what can we do about long tails? And the answer is, you know, I don't know. Um, th there were, back before Amazon Mechanical Turk, my group was working hard on work on learning with very few training examples. And just to mention some results, this is from Rob Fergus's thesis. Um, so you, you have some amount of images here, maybe 200 images of motorcycles, but the system is able to learn all the parts and attributes by itself and the shape and so on without bounding boxes and so on. So there is some level of non-supervision you can do and it still works. And in 2003, there's a paper by Rob Fergus and Fei Fei Li on one-shot learning. Can you learn a category from just one image, which sounded crazy at the time, but the idea is that you can learn a meta distribution from other categories, suppose you want to learn motorcycles, well, you, from one, in, one instance, well, you may learn uh, the hard way lots of, with lots of images, um, uh, faces, airplanes, spotted cats, etc. And then you can deduce from that some meta distribution and with one more training example from one new category, you can ca calculate the posterior, which is the, the germ of that new category model. And, and what this plot shows is that the error rate is much lower um, than if you were learning it the hard way with lots of images. So, so there are ideas for handling long tails. You should learn a lot from categories that are well represented and then did use things for the new ones. We know how to do it in the Bayesian setting. How would you do it with the deep networks, with the current mechanisms uh, or with kernel methods and that I don't know. And so that's an interesting question. Okay, now move on to the next question, <coughs> which is where do we get the data in the first place, and Kevin was saying, you know, that's the crucial aspect. Uh, data, well annotated data, is what makes um, a learning method successful. And um, and so there is nothing you can do other than ask the experts. Now we are used in machine learning and computer vision to build our own data sets because we pick categories of which we are the experts. You know, what is a human face? What is an automobile? What is a comb? What is a Buddha? Well, we know what these things are, and we can pick them out, and we can clean the data sets, and they're almost perfect. ImageNet was built this way. You just take, ask regular people, uh, find images with the dog inside, and we'll be able to do it. But for most of the categories that are of interest to us, well, those are the, the ones that we don't know about, the species of birds and the species of trees and skin lesions, etc. And so we have to find experts. Okay, and so for each niche of knowledge, there is somebody who knows uh, about it in the world, but <coughs> experts uh, have uh, a few annoying characteristics. First of all, they're hard to find. Second, you don't know who is an expert. You have to ask someone else and you will get referred. It's a bit like when you go to the doctor and you suspect you have a bad malignancy in your skin or something, you ask a doctor, how do I know that the doctor knows what he's talking about? Maybe I should ask for a second opinion. And in fact, it's well known that um, Experts disagree. So something, I still remember now, where is Park Smith? Is he uh, still here in the room? So in, uh, in 1992, Park and I were working with Osama Fayyad and Mike Pearl on classifying volcanoes on Venus. Nobody had ever been to Venus, and there was a big question of whether those, uh, those spots you could see in the pictures that Magellan had collected were volcanoes or were impact craters or just spots. And there were two volcanologists from Brown University who were working with us and they were giving us the ground truth and our, our machine learning computer vision algorithms were never getting quite good enough. They were always 70, 80 percent correct. It was so annoying until one day we took the two volcanologists and we asked them to label a new set of images in two separate rooms. And so they gave us the labels and then we compared them and they agreed 80 percent of the time. So that and that's somehow a, a Universal rule, experts agree 75, 80% of the time. Just remember this number, that's absolutely true. Okay, but the experts have lots of knowledge and so they can produce diagrams that explain to you what things look like and what kind of mistakes might you make and enormous number of good things. So you have to be able to collect uh, information, useful training data from, from the experts. And so this would be um, in uh, medicine etc. Now, I told you experts disagree. Not only they disagree because, and w in, in a way in which they don't know that they disagree, but they also disagree in ways in which they know they disagree because they have different dialects and different ways of organizing their knowledge. And so this would be uh, meat cuts. 
And so if you go to different countries, you'll go nuts. If you're looking for a specific meat cut, you cannot find it. If you go to Argentina or you go to Italy, you will not find the same thing as you find here, a porterhouse steak. No, it's you know, just not, not a concept. Those cows don't have porterhouse steaks. <laughs> and this is, if you ask uh, people to label faces and face parts, you get completely different systems of, um, of annotation between them. So here is another interesting question. As you ask experts, first of all, they're not uh, oracles. They're not going to give you exact data. They're going to disagree with themselves day over day. They will make mistakes, and they don't know about it. And second, they have different dialects. And you have to ask people to do the best they can do in the language that they know. You cannot <laughs> ask them to convert all of the way they're thinking into a different language that they don't know. And so you have to make use of information that comes in in very different uh, forms. So, so forget about the oracle point of view of machine learning. <coughs> so to give a, a, a sort of synoptic picture of the ingredients of Wikipedia, so we have uh, Wikipedia, we have users asking questions that may be visual. We have <coughs> public image data sets from which our systems may work and they're linked up in some way to, to the information. Uh, we, have, um, we have automata that we will build and will annotate and answer questions. We have experts that we can ask questions from. We can hire Amazon Turk annotators. And, these are, and then we have ourselves, who, and we design our automata, and we try to figure out what to do. So this is the, uh, the constellation of resources that we deal with. And as you can see, there are many different types of people who have to deal with Wikipedia. Uh, uh, and each one of these has a different role, has different uh, skills, different knowledge. And so what's the dynamical system that, uh, that links all of these uh, ingredients and components and makes uh, the truth uh, come up? And so we have a surgeon and I every year or so, we have a meeting with our students and we try to see what are the different components that we need to work on. And so we come up with spaghetti diagrams like these. <coughs> which are different types of data, different types of people, different machine learning algorithms, and they are all interacting. It's a giant dynamic system where the truth uh, at the end emerges. And so uh, let me show you a couple of um, specific projects that we have been engaged in, just to give you a sense for what do we do apart from pontificating at a high level. In order to ground the intuitions we have, and uh, in order to produce uh, actionable directions of research, we decided to engage into two uh, very practical projects. The first one is um, the first one we is recognizing birds, as you might have uh, suspected from the previous uh, set of images, and <coughs> we found splendid collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is a premier lab of ornithology in the U.S. Um, and uh, they receive an enormous number of queries from the public, and so they're a perfect portal for us to communicate with birders throughout the world. And it turns out that birders are computationally savvy or computer savvy because they buy expensive cameras to take pictures, then they upload them, and they upload them to bulletin boards and all of that. And so it's easy to interact with them. And we've built a system that is live now as of um, about 10 months ago, and uh, you find it it's called, so if you type uh, photo ID, Merlin photo ID, you get to our, our system, and it was built by um, Steve Branson and, and Grant Van Horn here. And so what you do is up, you upload your photographs in this green spot in the middle, and um, in about two or three seconds, so from the photograph, it will give you uh, a guess as to the species of the bird that it is. Now, this one is limited to North America, so it's about 500 species. And it's, uh, as you will see, 85% correct on <coughs> a very clean, high-quality data set that we use for training. And it's about 80% correct, 78, 80% correct on the images that are being fed to us by the general public. Okay, so it's quite useful. I'm talking about the top uh, choice. Now, how does the bird recognition system work? <coughs> so you start off from a picture that somebody may upload. There is a first um, step, which is identifying one bird in the picture. And this may be done by the user, drawing a bounding box, or the algorithm may pick a bird 
uh, at random in the, in the picture. And so now you have a piece of a picture containing the bird. Now the next step is, um, again, automatically uh, a number of landmarks are identified on the bird. So you can have a bird model aligned automatically with the picture. Now once you have uh, an alignment, there is uh, a stage of image warping that takes place um, and then uh, the image is fed to uh, a deep network which uh, produces a, a class, okay? So here I'm describing the architecture <coughs> of a system um, that was published at BMBC 2014. And um, what we know now is that um, this, uh, state, uh, this stage of alignment of uh, a model with a bird may or may not be useful. So the most recent networks are uh, almost as good as our system that has the alignment step at guessing the species without any alignment step. So going blind on the bounding box of, of the bird. And so these are a few details. So it turns out that the best performance uh, is obtained if you feed into the deep network. In fact, you have three parallel deep networks, one that handles the head, one that handles the body, and one that handles the context, namely the whole picture around the bird. Okay, so this is a detail, hap happens to be this way. So if you're really fond of deep networks, this is something to think about, you know, how do you, how do you make this more uh, unified and, and um, consistent? And again, the, the current performance or the performance two years ago was 75% without any hint to the machine as to where the bird might be. And um, if, you, if you disclose the location with the bounding box, 85% uh, correct species identification. Now, I, I don't remember if this is on CU, <coughs> CUB. Okay, so this is out of 200 species, but out of 500, I think we are seeing the same numbers. Okay, so I, I look at Grant, Grant does yes. I, I know that I'm not saying something stupid. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> but something we think is very important is handling the question of pose. So here is an interesting point for computer vision people because this is a place where uh, the geometry of the 3D world meets the image and it's being flattened into the image. And so a question that many s smart people around the world are working on at the moment in computer vision is, how do we train deep networks or other mechanisms to extract pose, to be invariant with respect to pose, and be able to read out the plumage of the bird to classified species uh, independently of the pose? Now, if you think back of the long tail distribution problem, it is very likely that um, right now our deep nets are learning the pose the hard way out of lots of many, uh, many different exam exemplars of birds. And so you need a thousand exemplars, f photographs to learn a species because the network needs to see that bird in all the characteristic poses of that bird. And there is no transfer of knowledge from one species to the next as to what are the typical poses of birds. So it seems to me that if you want to learn bird species from three examples, 10 examples, the network has to be able to transfer knowledge about poses and about parts and attributes, et cetera, from the frequent species into the long tail of, uh, of the system. And so this is, to me, a very important question. Now, again, <coughs> going back, you know, how was this whole thing obtained? How was it trained? And so we had to annotate an enormous number of images to be successful. And, um, and so there is a first data set called CU Birds 200 that was published five years ago, and a second one called NA Birds that was published last year at CVPR uh, that has the 500 species or so. And so, so the sequence of events was, first we were able to ask a number of birders to contribute their photographs. And so the birders gave us photographs, about 300,000, with what we call a weak label. Namely, they said that that was a bird, but who knows if they were right or wrong. Then we asked untrained annotators on the Amazon Mechanical Turk. They knew nothing about species of birds, but they knew a lot about what a bird looks like. We asked them to, um, to click on bird species. Actually, it was not Mechanical Turk. It was volunteers that we reached through uh, Facebook postings and the like. And so we got uh, 15 clicks per bird for a great number of images, about 1.5 million clicks. 
and this allowed us to understand what are the typical poses of the birds and lots of interesting information and also train our, our network on pose normalized birds. And then we had um, ornithologists go through most of the images and gave us what we call hard labels. And here we pretend that ornithologists are oracles and they're always right. Okay? And so if you're curious about you know, how do we know how good each mechanism is and so on, you find a paper in CVPR last year that will tell you quite a bit about it. So, <coughs> so now let me, um, let me look to the future. And let's take a little bit of a different point of view from the one I've been taking so far. So right now, I've just told you that we, um, we asked, uh, we thought that the ornithologists were oracles, more or less. And how do we know? Well, because we talked to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And we'll, if we look on citations and other metrics, we know that those people are extremely serious. And so we trust them. Okay. Now, think of a machine that has to learn about 100 million different categories of things in the world. That machine, how is it going to know the reputation of anybody who gives a piece of information? That machine should not trust anybody. That machine should work out by itself who are the people that know something and who are the people who don't. <coughs> so we have a chicken and egg problem. If we had a bunch of well annotated images, we could test people and know if they know. Or if we knew who the experts are, we could have the images annotated, but we don't know either one of the two. And so how do we proceed? And so this is what I want to talk to you about in the next um, five minutes. And um, this is um, work by um, uh, Peter Wellinder. So here is a species, the indigo bunting. And the way we used to, don't, to, to obtain these images was not through the birders, but through Flickr, and so we used to type the Latin name or the common name into the search box of, of Flickr.com and download all the images that came. So how do you know which images are the indigo banting and which ones are not? Well, we would find two or three pictures we trusted, use them as a learning, uh, use them as a guide, and then ask Amazon Mechanical Turkers to click on, on uh, indigo banting pictures amongst the ones that we had uh, downloaded from Flickr.com. And so here, if you ask four people to tell you, is this an indigo banting, you obtain, for the first image, an unqualified yes, all green. For the last image, an unqualified no, all red. But in between, we have various uh, shades of, of gray. So <clears throat> how do we interpret this? And so the, the state of the art used to be majority voting. And so I would like to convince you that you can do way, way, way better than just majority voting if you're willing to take a little bit of time and understand what goes on in the head of somebody who does this task. So first of all, refreshing our memory. So there are uh, two types of errors. There is a miss or a false negative, and then you have a false positive type error. And so let's keep in mind that there are these two types of errors, and they're different. Now, if, <coughs> if you look at what our annotators on, on the indigo banting category did, and so we had ground truth from another source for the purpose of understanding what was going on. Uh, you, can, you can see that each annotator, it's a dot here, each annotator, has a different uh, false positive and false negative rate. Okay? So all the annotators are spread out like sand on, on a beach. And, uh, and some are very good, and some are not very good, if you uh, look at the amount of error they make. And so we have the good ones up there. So they're about 10% error. We have ones that are at 50-50. We call them bots. You know, God knows these are people who are drinking their coffee and clicking on our, um, on our thing uh, at the same time. We have optimists who say always yes. So what are these people doing? Well, they say always yes. So they have a fantastic, they have a very low false, uh, uh, false reject rate, but <laughs> they have a high false accept rate. And then we have pessimists who say always no. OK, and then we have people who are anti-correlated. And so these must be, so I, I was telling my students, oh, these must be faith faith students from Stanford who are <laughs> uh, trying to mess up our data. Um, OK, so, so then how do we think about uh, the process? So think uh, of a binary variable that says, is there an indigo bunting in the picture? OK, that's a binary variable. That binary variable, together with a bunch of other variables, the viewpoint of a photographer, the weather on that day, the specimen, etc., those two variables generate uh, the picture, a million pixels. 
and its image sub i, the i index uh, refers to the image. Now, from that picture, if you think of the best possible birder in the world, think of the Ur birder, the platonic birder, that birder will extract some variables from the image, so the color of the plumage, the shape of the beak, the color of the legs, and so on, and will obtain a small vector of, of uh, features, maybe 10 features, maybe five uh, features, and those features are going to be describing what a bird is there in the picture and are going to be useful to classify whether a, um, an indigo bunting is there or not. So if the indigo bunting is there, so think of xi now as a, uh, as a one-dimensional variable, then, uh, then you have a certain distribution, and if it's no, it's a different distribution. So uh, now from uh, those features, now. Uh, think of the real annotator, one who is flesh and blood there doing the job for you. So that annotator has an index J and will produce uh, in his brain or her brain a set of features Y, I, J, which are uh, related to XI, the perfect features, but disturbed by some amount of noise, which may be caused by inattention, incorrect alignment of the eyes with the picture and all of those things. Okay, so... Um, if your uh, ground truth is uh, an xi that is very high or medium or low, uh, then different annotators will respond in different ways. A good annotator will have a small sigma, a small deviation from that uh, quantity, and a bad annotator will have a huge uh, spread around that. So now how is the label going to be produced? Well, the annotators are going to be, have a threshold or a classifier surface that is going to decide on a yes or a no depending on the y, i, j, and so they have a bias that uh, gives them uh, a higher threshold or a lower threshold or a middle threshold to respond. Okay, so now we know all the, uh, what are all the parameters of, of the annotators. I want to spend one more moment talking about the x, i, j, or uh, the y, i, j variable. So think of uh, having to discriminate between seagulls and hawks, then um, you may look at the shape of the beak or you may look at the color of the plumage. The hawks are brown, the seagulls are gray, uh, shape of the beak is different. And different annotators may have a different classifier surface. Some of them may be trained to look at the beak, some of them may be trained to look at the plumage, and some may be able to use both of those characteristics. Okay? So that's a multidimensional uh, characteristic of the annotator. So here is our model of annotators. Okay, this is what takes us away from majority voting into something that is much more productive. Uh, you have the z variable on the left. The x variable is, depends on the binary variable in the way we saw. So you have a multimodal distribution of x i and each one of the modes is conditioned on z i. And the x i now give birth to the y i j's, which are blurred versions of the x i s. And now based on on the noise of the annotator, their uh, classifier surface, and their bias, the annotators are going to produce a label Lij, yes or no. Okay? So the parts we can observe are the label, and we also know which annotator saw which image, but everything else is hidden from us. Oh, one minute. Oh, my god. OK. Uh, <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do three. <laughs> OK. So it's. <laughs> um, Okay, so, um, and so the only two observations we have are the gray nodes, and we want to estimate the z, whether the bird is there or not. And it turns out that the best way to do it is also to estimate these latent variables that tell us how uh, reliable these annotators are. And so this is the, the key. If we're willing to spend the time to model what is in the head of people, we can do a lot of work that um, we can deduce a lot that wasn't there before. And so, uh, so I'll skip, skip, skip. This is very interesting. Skip, skip, skip. Um, okay, clustering. So this was uh, related to the talk, this my first talk this morning. Let me skip. So I want to come to the punch at the end. And uh, <laughs> okay, so you can do clustering the same way. It turns out. Um, so this tells you how much I overestimated the amount of time. <laughs> So I want to tell you for one minute about another practical uh, question we're looking at. And so th in order to diversify a bit from birds, we decided to start working on, on trees. And the reason is that, um, uh, again, climate change, I'm very keen to help. And I think the trees are another. So all of you have seen trees die here in Southern California as an effect of, 
of the water restrictions, and so I'm very concerned to see what's, what's going on and what's happening. And, um, and so we thought that we should apply the same, more or less the same modeling and uh, classification strategy that we use on birds, on trees, and see where we can go. And so we are <coughs> scraping pictures from Street View and, um, and uh, ortho pictures from Google. In fact, we've confessed to Google and they're very happy that we're doing it and they're helping us now. So don't, uh, don't worry, Kevin, you don't need to give me away. And, um, and so we are, this is a picture of Pasadena. And so we have an automated system that is able, you give it uh, GPS coordinates, able to go there and detect all the street trees, the public trees of the city, and tell the species of the trees. And I'm uh, myself in this belief. I keep thinking that there must be a, a mistake in our um, scripts. They must be cheating in some way. But the, um, we seem to be able to detect 80% of the trees, of the public trees. And uh, of, the, of those, 80% of them, uh, the species is correctly classified out of about 600 species. So this is what we see. So this would be a um, holly oak or whatever. And so this is now being done over the whole of Los Angeles. It's about a million uh, trees that we have uh, detected. And so you have, there is a GUI. And if, if I had internet connection and time, I would take you through the GUI and show you all the things. But if you go to CVPR, you will see a demo, uh, et cetera. And so we can check all the trees of Los Angeles. So the last thought I would like to leave you with is this one. So the, the paradigm that we're used to in machine learning and computer vision is that our job as computer vision and machine learning engineers is to produce a black box that we hand over to a user, OK? So the, the problem we are facing is that um, there is an oracle that produces some labeled data. We choose an algorithm for uh, cl a classifier. We choose a training uh, algorithm. And we produce a black box. And it could be pedestrian detection. We hand it over to. Mobileye or to, um, or to Tesla, they give us some money and we are done. Right? So this is the paradigm in which we work. But <coughs> we know that uh, this is not true. And I hope I convinced you that uh, the situation is much more complex. So first of all, uh, we have no oracle. We have experts, and the experts do disagree. And the experts change their mind depending on how much data they have. And the more you automate the process of analyzing their data, the more they will change their mind, the more they will learn from the data you, you process. And, um, and there are many black boxes, and some will work better and wor some worse. You encounter new environments. You, you go back to the experts, and you tell them, look, you know, this is different. God knows what's going on. And the users will ask you new questions and pose new challenges all the time. So again, it's a dynamical system. And I think we should uh, enlarge our point of view to encompass all of that. So there are elements of psychology, elements of machine learning, elements of computer vision, et cetera. And, uh, and so the interesting question for, from my point of view is, you know, how does the flow of information uh, and how do different people uh, go through the system? How do different people collaborate? And what's the dynamics by which we achieve a higher level of understanding? OK. so. So thank you very much. Time for one or two questions. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great talk. Um, my question is: so uh, you mentioned the problem of, of experts, and obviously it's a it's a it's the challenge. And the examples, but the examples that you've shown uh, are all uh, clear have a ground truth, right? So you can compare. At least you can be confident uh, what's the performance of the system. But there are many problems that don't have ground truth, uh, just those experts. So how do, you how do you evaluate your system in that case? Yeah, precisely. So what we do now is we don't tell our system what the experts know. So we, and so we have non-experts, for example, label. And we see if uh, by, uh, by combining the knowledge or the work of 100 non-experts, we get to the level of expertise of an expert. And that's the only way we can validate our ideas, because ultimately, once we get to combining the knowledge of a bunch of experts, what do we know that is there? So it's a matter of gaining confidence by trying different things out. And sometimes you have the ground truth, sometimes you don't. So, yes, but it's a different, difficult problem. 
Pietro, you mentioned in the bird problem the posing variants. Yes. And I think there may be a way to do it using what I, I mentioned today. I did not yes, uh, I should mention the exact group. It's not a group. But I think you could do it by inserting a, a layer that gives you pooling over poses of similar birds. Yes. Anyway. Yes. So yes. It's and so the, I mean, in my mind, I didn't mention it, but uh, it's interesting. So once you've learned the poses of birds, does it give you a leg up on, as it were, on cows, for example? You know, and ca <laughs> can you? Does it uh, help? Uh, and so and. and and so why not submarines? Well, you know, they look different, but uh, who knows? And so uh, I'm curious about how you propagate um, uh, knowledge that you have learned in one setting to other settings, and, how, and where do you stop uh, generalizing? But maybe that's the basis of humor that uh, <laughs> Kevin was talking about, that when the generalization is, goes too far, then, then you should laugh. Yeah, well, you know, one of the outcomes of the work we did is that you can learn uh, to transfer knowledge about, so invariance, to position, rotation on the image plane, scale, from generic objects to any other objects. But if you want to generalize pose, you have to have seen objects of the same type. Like for faces, you need to have seen faces. For bodies, you know, you have, you have and this is one reason this is a conjecture why we have in visual cortex various patches of cortex dedicated to different classes of objects. You have patches in cortex dedicated to faces, to bodies, to places, because of, because of invariance to pose expression, those things that are not just image transformations. We'll see. Thank you. Let's thank Pietro again.